Welcome back, dearlings, to another episode of the Scones and Tums Book Club. I'm your host, Anna, and I am a wife, a mom, and a library programmer with a passion for creating a cozy, mostly bookish lifestyle. I will probably say this every single month, but I seriously cannot believe that we are in the last week of April already. Like you guys, John and I closed on our house this week. And while the whole process has dragged on forever, the year has literally flown by. We're closing this week, we move in the next week, and then the following week, I have a girl strip coming up. So, question of the day for you is, what is something you are looking forward to in the month of May? Let me know down in a comment, or direct message me on Instagram over at scones underscore. Now, go grab your cup of cozy, and let's jump into today's episode. This month, we read The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker, an English author most known for her Regeneration trilogy, which won the Booker Prize. And guys, if you haven't read this book, it is a doozy. In this book, we follow Briseis, a Trojan queen of Lynesis, who, along with the rest of the women of the city, becomes a Greek captive of the Greek army when Lynesis falls. We primarily follow her story as she goes from queen to captive to Achilles' prize and how the events of the Greek Trojan War unfold through her eyes. There are plenty of content warnings for this book regarding murder, death, rape, plague, and misogyny, all at varying degrees of description on the page. So if you haven't picked this up, please read with caution. And these themes will also be discussed in this episode, so if you're sensitive to hearing about these topics, this is your permission to turn the episode off, and we'll catch you next time. All right, to kick off our discussion of The Silence of the Girls, what is your overall rate experience reading this book, and how did you end up reading it? So, The Silence of the Girls was an experience for me to read. I feel really weird saying that this book is good. Because while there are elements of this book that were fantastic, like Pat Barker's writing style and Briseis' point of view into life in the Greek camp, the actual events of the story are absolutely brutal. Even the things that are not viscerally experienced on the page are merely, but are merely talked about are just horrific. As said, I did end up giving this book a 6.7 on my cough pile rating, which ends up being the equivalent to a three out of five stars. And side note, if you're not sure what I mean by a call paw rating, basically it is a rating system that I use to evaluate books based on seven categories that are then averaged out to get basically the call paw score, which then has a star rating equivalent. I'll link the original creator's video in the show notes if you're interested. Dear Sterlings, this is your official warning that the rest of this podcast is dark and full of spoilers. If you have not read this month's pick and would prefer not to get spoiled for events that happen in the novel, please take this as your permission slip to turn the episode off and come back after you've finished. Our second question of this episode is the Science of the Girls is a retelling of Homer's Iliad. How did reading this book impact your understanding of the source material or vice versa? So, confession time, because I am a terrible English major, apparently. I don't think I have ever read the entire Iliad. I read the Odyssey when I was a child at some point, probably for school. But I have never actually read the Iliad from start to finish. It's on my to-do list, but it has not happened yet. Because of this, I have no clue who Perseus was or what really happened during the Trojan War. Like, I know there's a bunch of stuff that happened before the Trojan War, like, really started getting, like, going, thanks to um, ancient literature and philosophy and literature classes that I took at NAU. So there's, like, stuff with Agamemnon having to sacrifice his eldest daughter, But then that ends up leading to his death upon his return home. And then I think that the events in the Iliad end up leading to the events in the Odyssey because Odysseus screws up in some way. 
and that, you know, leads to all of his adventures. But my details are very fuzzy, obviously. Anyway, my vague knowledge of what happens in the Iliad at least gave me enough context to what was happening, so I wasn't completely lost as I was going through this book. But I didn't really find that it added or detracted from my enjoyment, with one exception. At some point in the book, Agamemnon and Cassandra appear on the page together. It's very brief, but if you have read the Oristea, you will understand why I was in absolute hysterics reading the scenes in which reading that scene because I, I couldn't control myself apparently. But I will say that reading this novel on did give me a renewed interest in ancient Greek mythology and their stories. So I'm currently adding a number of retellings and new copies as well as new copies of the Iliad and the Odyssey to my Amazon wish list as we speak. Because obviously this is a gap in my reading in my reading life. So we need to fix that. Throughout the Iliad and Greek mythology as a whole, Achilles is always seen as a hero. How does this novel challenge that image throughout the book, and what was your opinion of him by the end? So, when I did study Greek mythology as a child and even in school, there was never really a focus on Achilles, so I have no clue who he is or what he's about. I know he's supposed to be a hero, I know our Achilles tendon is named after the myth um, about when he was an infant. Uh, his mother found out that she was mortal and held him in the river Styx to make him invulnerable. But because she was holding him by his ankle, that ended up being the one spot that makes him vulnerable to injury. But our current book on basically page one starts off with giving us the general feeling that the Trojans had towards Achilles. The book starts off by saying, great Achilles, brilliant Achilles, shining Achilles, godlike Achilles. How the epithets pile up. We never called him any of those things. We called him the butcher. And if that doesn't tell you how the Trojans felt about Achilles, I don't think anything else would. Achilles was a renowned fighter. But even the women and children in the city know that his war cry brings certain doom to their way of life. For some, he may have been seen as a potential liberator from the current fates. But when Briseis sees him slaughter her husband and her brothers, it's really not a surprise that she ends up hating him. I did find it incredibly interesting reading about Achilles in this book because even though it's told primarily from Briseis' point of view, We don't only get her side of the story. We also get to see how the other men, particularly Patroclus, react to Achilles and how he treats them. And in some of the reviews, there's a lot of like talk about whether Briseis fell in love with Achilles in the end. And I don't feel like she ever did. But I do think that she comes to respect him as a fighter and a leader. It's not that the good things that he does for his men erases the people that he's killed or the women that he's raped. But this is war. Doesn't make it okay, not in the slightest. But to those living in these times and in this culture, they know that this is a fact of their reality. They all know that this is what happens during wartime when everybody's basically operating off of instinct and rage and hate and control. And all they can do when you're on the losing side is make the best of that reality in whatever way that you can. Which is why we see some of the women are... I don't want to say happy, but like one of the women claims that she's in love with Ajax. You know, she's given him a son, even though like he, she hasn't, they're not married. They're still, she's like his like pinnacle mistress because she has given him a son and he's in love with her. 
but we we also know that you know their union is not a happy one because there is we talk about having she has bruises that she hides with her clothing and of course she tries to play them off as he has nightmares and um ptsd attacks of course she doesn't mention he has ptsd attacks but we know that's what it is and but she's willing to make it work the only way that she can like she loves her son and so even though she's in like this really crappy situation she's making the best of it but back to her question i don't know how i feel about achilles at the end like even now days after finishing this book i still don't know i think that he is in a hero in the eyes of many and the villain in the eyes of others I can appreciate how he was able to inspire his men and basically command Agamemnon's army so that to so many victories right up until the end. But at the end, he was still a very flawed human being. He suffered grief and trauma and caused grief and trauma. And his story was just so back and forth between being hero and villain and acting like a amazing war hero to being a spoiled child in the next page that it honestly just created a lot of conflict in my reading of him and I think that was probably the reason like I think that was probably on purpose on the author's part so I am really interested to see what happens in the women of Troy and if we see like more Briseis's thoughts on Achilles and who Achilles was um I think we also get like points of view from his son in the next book so it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with that our next segment isn't sponsored but I wanted to take a minute and tell you about a podcast that I have been loving recently which is Bingo Choom and K-pop Tunes so if you've ever found yourself curious about this whole K-pop scene that's been everywhere lately but you don't know where to start, or if you're like me and you were super into it for a while, but then you fell off the follow train, and now you have no idea who these new groups are, then you need to check out Bingo Choom and K-Pop Tunes wherever you get your podcasts. Best friends Raina and Lacey talk about a plethora of topics surrounding Korean media, including a new segment these days that focuses on some of the newest K-dramas available. Check out Bingo Choom and K-Pop Tunes available wherever you get your podcast. And now, back to the show. One of the biggest critiques in this novel is that it was written in more of a modern writing style. Do you feel that it took away from your reading experience or did it make the ancient stories much more easy to enjoy? I personally found that the writing style in this book felt like a blend between modern historical fiction and Greek epic tales with a bit of like sitcom style asides all put together in a blender. And honestly, it made me kind of dizzy. (laughs) I think Pat Barker made it work well as each dial shift was usually part of a specific turn of events but it was still very jarring every time it happened. So every time we, that Briseis would kind of make a dear reader, like lady whistle down approach style aside, it threw threw me off and threw me out of the story for a moment, even though it was always at kind of a pivotal moment whether it was like a major plot point or if it was like a shift in her own perspective this book also changes perspectives across parts and chapters but none of them are labeled so that had me really confused as well throughout this book i actually started going through the novel from the very beginning like labeling each chapter so that way i knew who was speaking and then i got lost so i had to stop This said, I did find that the more modern style of storytelling made following the sequence of events, like the actual plot points A, B, C, D, much easier to follow than normal epic poetry. 
so in the pieces of the Iliad, but especially like in the Odyssey, which I have read, I have always had a hard time following the sequence of events and like placing the different events in correlation with the rest of the poem as a whole. And Pat Barker's writing style made this a lot easier to follow because it does happen linearly. But this book is 100% different than anything else I read. But I did feel that it made this book stand out. And our last question. From what we know of ancient Greek culture and customs, the gods play a much bigger role in the lives of mortals than we are witness to in this novel. What did you think of their omission from the story? This was driving me bonkers the entire time I was reading this book. From what we have been taught about ancient Greek life, the pantheon of gods, goddesses, and creatures play a massive role in the daily lives of mortals. And yet, with the exception of a plague supposedly sent by Apollo, and when Achilles' mom shows up, we see absolutely nothing of them. They literally do not exist, except for that one itty-bitty segment of time within the story. I found this to be a very interesting choice by Pat Barker to admit them. And I'm really wondering if the reason they were admitted is because Briseis has lost all faith in the gods. I am on the fence about whether she had faith in them to begin with. But at least after, you know, the fall of her city and the slaughtering of her husband, father, brothers. She definitely does not have any faith in the gods whatsoever now. Like, she has been denied a child by her husband. Her city has been sacked. She's gone from queen to concubine, taken from her semi-decent captor, Achilles, given to Agamemnon, who isn't known for being gentle, back to Achilles, and it's... That's just in the first third of the book. Like, honestly, why would she believe in gods who have supposedly forsaken her? So, it could totally be on purpose. But overall, I did find it very odd that we didn't hear at least, like, the other characters in the camp talking about them more, at the very least. Like, Briseis spends a lot of time talking to the other women and in the war camp. She talks to some of the other men in the war camp, and we never hear it come up in conversation. So, the f- I'm really wondering why... They were completely omitted from the world building up the story at the very least. Okay, now it is time for one of my favorite segments of our show, which is Librarian Anna Recommends. So if you enjoyed The Science of the Girls by Pat Barker, let me go ahead and recommend that you pick up book two in the series, which is called The Women of Troy. This book picks up where The Science of the Girls leaves off with The Fall of Troy. We learn what happens when the Greeks pack up their spoils of war with the intent to return to their homes and how Briseis and the other Trojan women make their ways in a new world when there is no way to return to the way that things used to be. These next couple picks I have not read yet, but they are now on my list because they are also Trojan War retellings of various styles, and I am 100% here for that right now. The first one on my list is A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes. I saw this at the library I used to work at when it first came out, and I am absolutely obsessed with the cover and the premise. This book follows the lives of various women after the fall of Troy. We meet queens, daughters, concubines, goddesses, as they tell their stories that have been omitted from history. Also, I found out that Natalie Haynes is not just a writer. She is also a classicist, a stand-up comedian, and a broadcaster, And she has a show called Natalie Haynes Stands Up for the Classics. And it has been immediately added to my queue to listen to on Good Pods. The next one is called For the Most Beautiful. And it is written by Emily Hauser. So this book interweaves the story of Briseis and Criseis, who we both meet, we meet both of them in The Science of Girls. And just tells their story from start to finish and how, 
you know, they interact briefly during the camp and what ends up happening to them afterwards. And now, it is the moment that we have all been waiting for. The reveal of the book we are reading for the month of May. If you are a part of our Patreon community, then you know that I was struggling to choose the book for this month. So, I opened it up to our patrons to vote on all of the options that I had picked out. And our winner is... Our book club pick for the month of May is... The Forest of Stolen Girls by June Her. I fell in love with June Her's writing about two-ish years ago when her debut novel, The Science of Bones, came out. And I am so excited to finally be picking up her follow-up novel. I honestly cannot do the description of this book justice, so I'm just going to read you the publisher's copy. Hawani's family has never been the same since she and her younger sister went missing and were later found unconscious in the forest near a gruesome crime scene. The only thing they remember is that their captive wore a painted white mask. To escape the haunting memories of this incident, the family flees their hometown. But years later, Detective Min, Hawani's father, learns that 13 girls have recently disappeared under similar circumstances. And so, he returns to their hometown to investigate, only to vanish as well. Determined to find her father and solve the case that tore their family apart, Hawani returns home to pick up the trail. And as she digs into the secrets of the small village and reconnects with her now estranged sister, Hawani came comes to realize that the answer lies within her own buried memories of what happened in that forest all those years ago. Like our previous two books, there are some content warnings on this one, so if you're sensitive to reading about child abuse, death, grief, kidnapping, mutilation, poisoning, sexual reference sexual assault, slavery, and mention suicide, then please feel free to skip this book or just read with care. Guys, I am not trying to pick books with tons of content warnings. It just keeps happening. Maybe this June we will read something light and fussy. Okay. So that is it for our show this month, my dearest dearlings. If you have enjoyed this episode, please give this podcast a rate and review wherever you get your podcasts and share it with a friend. If you want to check out more cozy, mostly bookish content from me, join me over on Patreon at patreon.com slash thelibrariananna or follow me on Instagram at sconesandtomes underscore. As always, all links to the resources mentioned in the episode will be listed down in the show notes. Until next time, stay cozy. Thank you.